just go ahead and close your video. Leave this going. So Caitlin, where are you from? I'm from Ashland. I work with Christina. Oh, oh with Chris. Oh, so you're filling in for her. Yeah, That's awesome. she wasn't feeling well today. Yeah. So Christina of our Christina Tevin is going to be teaching the next two uh, respite oh. uh, groups for us. She she uh, um, directs the uh, Ashland Special Needs Ministry in Ashland County. Oh, cool. Okay. Are you guys feeling off the, the pole? Mine said it wouldn't submit, said there was an error. Oh. Is that the same with you, Caitlin? I think mine submitted. I did it. Well, I'm going to just go ahead and end and it. So you guys probably could just tell us. <laughs> Okay, oh, the no yeah. caregivers. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Only one of three. So these are the, the folks that do the supporting of other people. From what I know about both. Stop okay. sharing. Okay. Close that. Close that. And Tracy, are you a family member or a caregiver? Or if you could let us know. Okay. Okay, how do I get out of this? Oh, I wish we had an admin <laughs> so many times. <laughs> okay, thank goodness for uh, editing. Well, thank you guys for joining us tonight uh, on the first part of our respite, short breaks for caregivers. Uh, our speaker is Barb Seferis and uh, who has a lot of experience in this area. Uh, but before we get to Barb, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quickly to tell you about uh, the people who are supporting this event. And hopefully my screen is gonna behave. Okay, so here we have the uh, first slide and I don't need to go over that. I'm just gonna edit that. All right. So my name is Deb Peterman. I'm with the Center for Disability Empowerment. And this uh, opportunity tonight um, is a result of a grant from the Ohio Department of Development on Disabilities. And the grant is called Ohio Family Network. Um, so on your upper right is the logo for Charting the Life Course. Uh, and for this meeting, we will be using um, a couple tools from Charting the Life Course. Uh, wonderful program you should uh, take time to get to know it is coming to ohio and it's just a wonderful framework in helping people to plan um, develop identify uh, aspects in their life to make a goal towards a good life um, so it covers a variety of things and tonight we're just going to be focusing on best fit. so who are we with the center for disability empowerment uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit age, uh, agency. We are community based non residential center for independent living that is driven by choice and direction of people with disabilities. There are 12 of them in Ohio, and uh, these independent living centers are all over the country. So, what do we do? Our mission as CDE is to provide supports and resources for people with disabilities in order for them to be participants and contributors in their communities as they live, learn, worship, work, and play alongside people who do not have disabilities. The Center for Disability Empowerment, we serve Franklin, Union, Delaware, and Licking County. We offer five core services because we are federally mandated, mandated to do so. Uh, we offer information referral, if, if you, we don't know, we'll find out. Um, we offer independent living skills and development, uh, peer support and systems support, um, advocacy uh, services for self, again, systems, and transition services, meaning uh, transition for youth with disabilities,
organized. So, okay. So go ahead, Barb, and uh, share your screen. And I want to introduce Barb. Um, she is a Chartered Life Course Ambassador, uh, Life Course um, Nexus Facilitator, and Advocate and Sibling. Uh, she offers a lot of wisdom. She has a lot of uh, uh, experience, and she'll do a, a wonderful job presenting a family perspective and how families can look at what they have uh, or who they have in their life in order to help them uh, be a part of this uh, respite. Did I lose Barb? We're doing really well, aren't we? <laughs> I'm going to unpause. I appreciate you guys. So I want to take this time to introduce our key speaker tonight, Barbara Saferis. Uh, she is a friend of mine and a great mentor. Uh, she is the Chart in the Life Course Ambassador, Life Course Nexus Facilitator, Advocate, and Sibling. Uh, we've had many laughs talking about our sibling connections. But Barb, uh, I'm thankful that you're going to be talking about the family perspective using the Chart in the Life Course tool. I'm going to pass it on to you now. Oh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Um, did you? Can you put the handouts in the chat? Uh, yes. Deb? Okay, yep. great. So <clears throat> again, my name is Barb Seferis. I work for the Family Resource Network of Ohio, which is at the Nysonger Center. And um, I'm happy to be here. I've done many things in my life, uh, but from the time I was four years old, I was a sibling. My youngest brother, Nick, was diagnosed with a developmental disability when I was four years old and just going into kindergarten. I retired from the Cuyahoga County Board where I worked for 36 years. My background is as a speech language pathologist. So my passion has always been about helping people have a voice and um, supporting others to recognize that communication and respond appropriately. For this topic, um, I have been a family caregiver as long as I can remember from the time I was four. <laughs> so um, currently I am a family caregiver um, providing ongoing direct support uh, for a good chunk of the day. So I understand what it's like to be a family member, but I also understand what it's like to provide that direct care every day. Um, the presentation today is provided by the Family Resource Network of Ohio, which is out of the Nysonger Center at the Ohio State University uh, through funding from the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities. We want to use Charting the Life Course in Ohio to support and empower people. So there will be five handouts, and I can hear Deb clicking and putting them in the chat. You can find these resources on lifecoursetools.com and then go to the heading Life Course Library. And then exploring life domains, these are all drop downs. And then go to the section on respite. There are a lot of great resources on respite. So tonight, what I hope to do is share information about charting the life course, share some tools um, that you might find helpful when you're planning respite for yourself, but also as you're supporting others to think about what does respite mean? What would I do? What, you know, why is it important? If you have questions, please put them in chat. I would, uh, I like to answer questions as I go. So please feel free to do that at any time. We are a small group. So I might even ask you to unmute and share. Charting the Life Course uh, is a framework that was developed by and for people with disabilities and their families. 
We use a lot of icons, as you can see on the left. Uh, we try to use clear language uh, because we want the tools and the resources to be accessible and useful to everyone. So <clears throat> I've had a lot of experience sharing the tools and resources with families, with people with lived experience from young teenagers to older adults, um, and also uh, with, with uh, professionals. We're part of Ohio as part of a national community of practice. And the beauty of that is we get to hear what people are doing in other states and we share with them what we're doing in Ohio. So the Charting the Life Course Respite Tools were developed in partnership with ARCH. And like I said, I've been a family caregiver for since I was four and I am on Medicare. So over 60 years. And I never heard of ARCH. And I was, I was like, you're kidding. There's actually uh, a national network, the Access to Respite Care and Health. They have a website. I've put it there. And respite is important because when you look at the United States, let's say, how many family caregivers are providing care, not only to children with disabilities, adults with disabilities, but people who have been in accidents, people who are uh, aging parents. And so a lot of caregiving is provided by families, as those of you that are families surely know. So charting the life course is really about having different conversations and the tools that I'm gonna share with you, I think are so helpful to help families think about rest, but not as a service, but as a support. So respite is a break from caregiving. It's not necessarily the service that you can get through uh, some waivers or some county boards or some other entities. It's really a different way of thinking. And um, it's not just talking, it's not just supporting people who are eligible for services, but all people. And it's for anyone, regardless of age or ability. A lot of people, when I share information, say, this is great, but it's only for people who can talk, or it's only for people who have good cognitive skills. And as you all know, you're working with people with disabilities, you're a family member, you know that being person-centered is a federal mandate. And it doesn't mean that we're only person-centered with people who can talk, but being person-centered using Charting the Life course is for everyone, regardless of age or ability. So I've seen families use Charting the Life course to help plan for their babies. Uh, that were diagnosed with a disability, but also with parents in their 90s who are now um, uh, experiencing some difficulties. As with all person-centered approaches, we get the information from the person, from their words and actions, and from the people who know them well. And as a speech language pathologist, I spent my career working with people who did not use words to communicate, but I always found someone who knew them well enough to tell me what their communication was, what their actions meant, what they liked, what they didn't like. So there are no yes buts. In Ohio, we want everyone to understand and use charting the life course. We want families to use it, uh, the tools and resources to help plan for a good life. We want people with lived experience to use charting the life course and we want professionals to use charting the life course. We have a community of practice. We meet quarterly. Today was our community of practice meeting. The next one is in January. Uh, but if you want to sign up for that community of practice, here's the website. A community of practice is a group of people who are passionate about a topic. We're passionate about using Charting the Life course to support and empower 
people with lived experience and families. And so when you attend a community of practice, it's not a training, but it's more of how people are using charting the life course to impact their life. So why do we talk about respite? <clears throat> because it's important for, for caregivers to have breaks. It's important for the family. If any of you are families, you know that, you know, sometimes you just need to take a break and it helps the family renew, rejuvenate. It also may help the family have some time together. Um, I know growing up with a sibling with a disability, uh, a lot of siblings that I've met, adults, will say that what they wish their families had done, what they wish their parents had done, was spend time with them, separate from their brother or sister. And if you have a break, you just have better relationships with people. And you know that everybody takes breaks. All families take breaks. So it just helps families feel uh, a, a little more like other families. We take a break, we're not always doing caregiving. So what's the benefit for the caregiver? Um, I know as a caregiver, uh, recently I have spent probably four hours of every day providing direct hands-on support and not just making sure somebody got up or went to bed, but providing direct hands-on support. And so why did I need a break? Well, because I needed to go to the grocery store. I needed to go to medical appointments. I needed to take care of myself. Um, I needed to go to the gym because that gave me time to just exercise be away from caregiving, even though my cell phone was right there on the treadmill with me. And if it rang, I answered it. Um, but it also gives you more time to spend with other people that are important to you. I'll never forget once a mother told me, I, I said to her, what would you do if you had a break? And she goes, I would just love to take a bath in my own bathtub with the door closed and not worry about what's happening outside that door. And she couldn't do that because she always had to be hyper alert to what her son was doing. And she could never shut the door because then who knows what was happening outside that door. But it could be something simple like taking a bath, reading a book, taking a walk, being on the phone un uninterrupted. I, um, I was on a call with some siblings from all over the United States uh, last night. And uh, one of them said to me privately, um, I remember the last time I had a phone conversation, you were, you were engaged in caregiving. And I was trying to be so subtle <laughs> and be attentive to her phone call. And I thought, oh gosh, she heard all that. Um, so, you know, just being able to have a break. It also reduces the stress. You know, caregiving is tiring. It's, a, it's not tiring, it's exhausting. And having a break reduces that stress. Sometimes I would just have to say, um, sometimes I would just have to say, I need to get, I need to get away. I need to just go out and take a walk. And I don't know what that noise is, but somebody's got the mic on. But also think about the person that we're taking care of. You know, they may be getting tired of us <laughs> because when we're caregiving, we're probably being directive, we're guiding. And boy, I was so conscious of that. Like, don't try and boss the, you know, I don't want to sound like a boss or I'm directing, I'm, you know, but sometimes I had to say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, that won't work, stop. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> um, and so I'm sure he got tired of me doing that, you know, stop, I, you know, don't boss me around. Also, when what I saw is when that we did have a break from each other and from caregiving, that when we got back together, it was like, a fresh, a fresh start because we both had 
a break and had time with other people. So our core concept in charting the life course is we want everybody to live, love, work, play, learn and pursue their life aspirations in their community. We have eight principles that I'll refer to as we talk about respite. First of all, this is for all people. All people who are caregivers need respite. The tools and resources I'm gonna share can be used with all people from birth through the end of life across all abilities. We value family systems and we know in, a, in the United States just how much support families provide. The service system can never provide, uh, cannot afford to provide the support that families do. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, having a trajectory or a vision of what good respite looks like so that the, the caregiver and the care recipient have a good life and they have good life outcomes. I'm going to keep going. So we want everybody to have a good life. We want, you know, one of the challenges for me as a caregiver was making sure that I made uh, my partner feel like he was in control of his life. I was there to support him and, and helping him feel interdependent and not dependent to maintain his um, dignity and respect. But also I needed support so that I could support him. You know, it's the old, you, you, you know, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on someone else. You have to take care of yourself. And we want to support families so they can take care of the people they love. And we want everybody to have better lives. So I'm going to go over two concepts that are in all plans because they're mandated by the feds, by Medicaid and Medicare. And we'll refer to them as I share some of the respite resources with you. So in all plans, uh, we have the topic of important to, that is mandated by Medicaid. Every plan has got to identify what's important to people. And this is what people tell us with their words or their actions. And it's not likes and preferences, but it's what they need in their life to feel happy and satisfied. And the categories that we usually consider are, who are the people that are important to them? And not just friends and family, but who? Because we don't like everybody in our family. So who's really important to us? Uh, what gives people status and con control? You know, we all have money. We have jobs. That gives us status and control. We have car keys. We have house keys. Um, we have technology. What's important to people as far as things to do and places to go? And we'll talk more about important too. I just want to go through the definition right now. What's important to people about rituals and routines? Um, you know, one of the things my partner loves was uh, the Ohio State football games, the Browns games and the Guardians baseball games. So that was a routine. When those games were on, we watched them or he watched them and I got some respite for a couple hours. <laughs> uh, rhythm and pace of life, you know, are they people that, are they move, 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 or are they kind of slow into their day? What's important to people to have? What gives people purpose and meaning? And then what's important to people for their culture and identity? Um, I always share that I, I'm Greek American, I'm Greek Orthodox and, boy, I can't separate that from myself because it's the language, it's the food, it's the traditions, it's the, uh, it's uh, uh, how you greet people. It's everything. It's my whole essence and being. When we talk about important for, it's what other people say, the doctor, the parents, the psychiatrist, the justice system, and what's important for health and safety and for people to be valued. So one of the resources that's in the chat is the Charting the Life Course Portfolio for Respite. There's one for planning, but this is specifically for respite. And I want to go through the portfolio with you. It can be completed by the caregiver, and it can also be completed by the care recipient. 
So what's good for me as a caregiver, but also what's good for the care recipient? And as we talk about respite and caregiver and care recipient, you know, please remember that help is defined by the helped, not by the helper. So a lot of times people, staff feel they're helping and maybe the family or the person is like, oh gosh, that's not helping. <laughs> and they just won't let you know. So think about in your own life, have, has anyone ever done something for you? Oh, I just wanted to do this to help you. I actually shared an experience with Deb. I had somebody helping me uh, straighten up some stuff and she was moving stuff all around and then I didn't know where it was. So it's like, you weren't helping, you know, I didn't say this to her, but she wasn't really helping me. <laughs> she, she was making more work for me. Uh, think about when people have done something they feel is helpful and you're like, oh, thank you very much. I have to undo this now, you know? So just remember, that's why we wanna know from the caregiver, from the care recipient, what is helpful? So this is the um, Life Course Portfolio Exploring Respite page. And it's really a summary of what's going on in my life. The light blue section is completed. It could be by the caregiver or the care recipient or both actually. What's going on in my life? What does caregiving look like? You know, are you dressing somebody? Are you feeding them or are you reminding them? What does caregiving look like? People can't help you if they don't know what it looks like. Then what are the concerns and stressors? You know, sometimes it was um, maybe being too close in proximity for too long, you know, and not having some separate space. And then what's the impact on the caregiver? And what's the impact on the person? So for those of you that are caregivers, and you know, if you're a parent, you're a caregiver. It's not just respite with somebody with a disability or somebody who's aging, but what does caregiving look like in your life or maybe in someone you're supporting? And type it in chat. I actually, when I had someone um, helping me, I actually had a schedule of what caregiving looks like. At this time, you do this. At this time, you do this. So what does caregiving look like? For my brother, Nick, he had to be fed. He had to be dressed. He had to be bathed. You had to brush his teeth. So caregiving was not just, hey, Nick, go put on your clothes. It was actually getting him dressed. Anybody type anything? Ah, thank you. Somebody type something. Yeah, making a schedule. Absolutely. And routine and following it too, Tracy, right? <laughs> oh, you got to follow that routine. So think about when you're working with people and you're helping them get respite, um, asking them, what, what does caregiving look like? What are you doing? The second section, oh, someone else typed something. Thank you. Offering a caregiver time to do such a, yes, absolutely. Oh, great point, Deb. You know, even giving people time to think. I did a presentation once with um, uh, therapeutic respite providers who work with youth that are involved in multi-systems. And they said, I'm going to use this as my conversation uh, when I first meet with a family to get this information because I want the respite that I'm providing, you know, the respite that they were providing was to help maintain that family together so that the child did not have to go into residential treatment or foster care. Ah, keeping our friends safe, loving them where they are, uh, and giving them to Jesus. Basically, we provide, uh, practically, I'm sorry, we provide meals and connect families with each other. Yeah. 
Time to think is underrated. You are right. You are right. Boy, have I, I, I don't know how many times I said, I just need to go be alone and do some thinking. Absolutely. The second section is how would taking short breaks help you? You know, it would get me away from them for a few minutes. It would uh, also be uh, give maybe the care recipient someone else to interact with that wasn't always directing them or, or watching them or guiding them. And then um, think about those for yourself. What would be the benefit of having short breaks? For me, it was um, one of the benefits was just being able to have conversation with somebody. Uh, another benefit was just having time and, and take this the right way. But when you're the caregiver and you're up and you're doing, and the minute you sit, someone is saying, Barb, and you're jumping up to do. Um, the benefit of me for taking short breaks was that I got to sit and not do. And I would go to a friend's house and she would serve me dinner and I would jump up to take the plates and she would be like, you just sit. And it was such a difference to be taken care of for a, mo for a meal, as opposed to having to jump up all the time re-energize, keeps us from getting frustrated. Absolutely. Oh my God. Uh, just being present, going both, going both ways. Ooh, Caitlin, I'm not sure what that means. What is that? I just mean? meant, uh, with keeping us from getting frustrated with repetitive behaviors. I know people have gotten frustrated with me. I've gotten frustrated with them. So <laughs> giving us each a break from each other sometimes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you so much. <laughs> I love it. And then the third section is, what would I do if I had a break from caregiving? And that's an important question to ask, because then you get to learn about what's really important to someone. The mom who wanted to take a bath in her own bathroom with the door closed, uninterrupted, and not having to worry about what was happening outside that door. For me, what would I do? Um, I enjoyed during COVID walking in the parks. Um, after COVID, when I felt safe going to the gym, because I just needed to, I guess, expend energy. I don't know. Um, Going out, just, you know, going to uh, sit with my friend, who I'll talk about a lot. She was my lifesaver. And then who would I spend time with? I, I, I'm okay being alone. So that wasn't always like, oh, I got to go see or go to got to go do. Um, but I didn't get to see a lot of family because of COVID, because of distance. And because of caregiving and trying to cover caregiving, if I left uh, town to visit family, it was it got very complicated. So what needs to be in place? So I'm comfortable leaving the person I'm caring for. For me, it was finding somebody who wouldn't um, feel that their role was to make sure that he did everything he was supposed to do. I didn't want somebody who would be bossy because I knew that wouldn't last. <laughs> And then I wouldn't get my respite. It had to be somebody who was uh, kind and just interactive. And um, I was blessed. I found somebody like that. I also didn't want anybody who would make him feel like he was being supervised or watched, like you didn't do what you were supposed to do. So think about that. If you had respite, a break from caregiving, what would you do? Yes, I am part of Silver Sneakers, yes. <laughs> I get to go to the Y and exercise. What would you do if you had a break? It's 
I think a lot of parents will want to want to sleep, take a nap, uh, maybe just have a hot meal, <laughs> wow. a hot cup of coffee. I know at family retreat with Johnny and friends, you know, there are families that are like, I haven't had a hot cup of coffee with my family in years. Oh, my goodness. I believe you said sleep. You know, I forgot about that. Um, when I was a service coordinator, you know, when, when you'd ask families, what would make your life easier? Or what, you know, what are you concerned about? And they would be like, I can't sleep through the night because my son or daughter gets up constantly and they might leave the house and I've got to be worried about what they're doing and, uh, and sleep is, you know, what is the one thing that everybody tells us we need to have for our own wellness? It's good sleep. A lot of our families take time to go to the grocery store or go on a date with their partner. Um, during one of the former family series that I did on turning the life course, uh, one of the dads said, uh, my wife and I have not been out on a date in like 15 years. And, and, and he didn't mean a date. He just meant the two of us have not been able to go out and do anything, get a meal, get a cup of coffee, nothing. And he said, because one of us has got to be with my son at all times. They may want to attend church, absolutely, without their children, absolutely. I tried that once and I got six phone calls in an hour and a half. And I said, Father, told the priest, I said, Father, I can't do that again. <laughs> it was too stressful. And you know, he looked at me and he said, Barbara, you're at church on Sundays. And I said, Father, thank you. You just gave me a great gift. So what is a good life? Well, a good life is that we have dreams. It's is that we have people who believe in us and who uh, we have what's important to us. And we have more good days than bad. I mean, I, I've been a caregiver so long that I know what it means I know I'm not going to be able to just say, hey, I think I'll go out now for five hours. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. But you you want to have, you still want to have a good life. So, you know, one of the things I, I have told many people is I still need to work. I'm retired, but I consult. And I was like, I still need to work. My whole life cannot just be a caregiver. I have to do something else to feel purpose and meaning in my life. I felt I feel purpose and meaning as a family caregiver, but I also need to feel purpose and meaning uh, as Barb the professional. So we talk about six domains of life. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. You know what? It was okay, Wally, because I knew what I was doing was critical. I attended church in the past. I was the, on the board and did all sorts of things. and. You know, I just saw it as right now in this time of my life, uh, being present in the building is not what I can do. I can do other things for uh, my church and also for my spiritual well-being, well but thank you. Thank you, Wally. So one thing that may help families think about, well, what do I want? What would be helpful? is the vision tool. And it goes through those six life domains. I'm gonna go back a slide. We talk about life and charting the life course in the six areas that we all talk about life. Where do we live? What do we do? Uh, what do we do for our spiritual and social well-being? How do we take care of our physical health and emotional health? Um, do we feel safe? And I don't mean health and safety like we hear in services. But, you know, I live in a condo. I live in a neighborhood that I feel pretty safe in. I have an alarm on my, you know, on my house because um, I, 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 because <laughs> not that anything bad has happened, but just because, <laughs> because I was traveling a lot for work and I didn't want to come home late at night and be surprised. So I kind of had the alarm on my house. So I felt like, okay, I've done something. Uh, to keep myself a little bit more safe. And I drive a vehicle that I feel safe in in the snow because I live in the snow belt. So safety and security is not just 
health and safety in the service system. And advocacy and engagement, I'm very active um, in uh, the sibling uh, network um, and also um, in charting the life course and supporting families. So this tool is called the vision tool. It can help you if you're helping people um, think about rest, but what's important to you? What's your vision for you and for your child? Yeah, you know, what do you, what do they want to do? Um, and some of the therapeutic respite providers, now I know you're not, but some of them said, you know, if I know what someone wants to do, like if they want to eventually work with animals or work with children, when I'm providing that therapeutic respite, maybe we can go to an animal shelter and volunteer. Maybe we can go to a pet store and look at the animals and see if this person really does want to be around animals. Um, and so they were like, this will help me make the respite more meaningful and not just be babysitting. So what is their vision of a good life? Then in the second tool in the uh, respite portfolio is the life trajectory. So we want to ask people, what is a good life for the care recipient? Hence that vision tool. What's their vision for a good life? That they want to work with animals, that they want to have their own apartment. I don't know. Um, that they want to be part of a sports team. Um, maybe they want to go to a youth group. What's a good life for them? And then what's a good life for the caregiver? For me, I said it was, I, I needed to continue to work. And I, have, I knew how to build my schedule of caregiving and work. I mean, I, and people didn't, people were like, oh, you'll, you won't be able to do this. And I'm like, yeah, just watch. I will meet every commitment that I have made because I know how to schedule my commitments and my caregiving so that I can do both. And then what's a vision of good respite so both parties can relax, the care recipient and the caregiver. So good respite for me um, was someone who could come over and I would feel safe with them uh, either um, with my loved one and in the home, <laughs> you know, uh, good respite was that they weren't bossy and didn't think that they were there to control, but that they were there to just chat and provide some company. Let me, oh, go ahead. Did somebody say something? Okay, I thought somebody was gonna say something. The next section that we want people to look at is just as important as what is a vision for a good life is what don't we want? So what I didn't want was someone who would start micromanaging uh, for someone. In fact, I even said, um, just look at the pill minder and uh, don't worry about reminding them or, uh, what if they don't take their pills? I said, um, just let me know. Just leave the pills in the pill minder. Just don't force, don't direct. Because the minute you say you need to take your pills, you forgot to take them. Now you're being, uh, you're being bossy in their, in their mind. And you, that will not work. So it's like they skip a dose. Okay, it's okay. What can, you, what can I say? but also what they don't want. So uh, what would be, what would not work for me, but also what would not work for them? <laughs> when my mother was alive and living with me, I was like, don't tell her you need to. Don't use that phrase, you need to, because that will put her right over the edge. <laughs> and. <laughs> And then she'll never let you in the house again and I won't get my respite. No, <laughs> I am not self-centered. I hope I'm not coming across that way, <laughs> but I'm being honest with you. That's the stuff we need to know. And then for 
respite, what have you tried in the past that worked? Um, and then what have you tried that didn't work? So you can learn a lot, you know, sometimes it's, we tried with somebody, you know, of the opposite sex and that didn't work. Or we tried with somebody younger or older, that didn't work. Um, you know, for me, when I needed respite and I was looking for someone at that time, I was care a caregiver for both my mother and my partner. And um, I, I didn't know anybody. And I asked people that I trusted, do you know anybody who would be able to uh, just come in and do a, an eyes on check? And initially that's all they needed, an eyes on check. Um, and if they wanted help with warming up dinner, cause it was all made and packaged and everything was there. They didn't have to do anything. And, um, a friend of mine said, I know somebody, I think they would be good. I trust them. And they were a blessing. They lived two doors, three, one, two, three, four doors away from me. So they could walk and be here. And that was very convenient because, because she was so close. <laughs> it just made life much easier. And then what would it take? The next section, that middle section is, so what would it take to have a successful respite? What would it, what would we not want? What do we want to stay away from? This is the integrated support star. And in the middle, you would put whatever it is, finding a caregiver, you know, or, um, finding a, you know, getting a break to go to church, whatever it is. In the middle, you would put the outcome or the concern. And then you look at five possible areas of support. I got to read your note later, Deb. Uh, I can't read it right now. So when we look at five areas of support, we know that everybody can't get paid respite. But if you want a break, what can you look at? And there are five areas. So the first area is personal strengths and assets. So when I think about my mother and my partner who both had strokes within two months of each other, and I became their caregiver for both of them, their strengths were both of them could read. So I could write directions for, you know, I could write things out for them. Uh, another strength that they both had was that they were pretty safe walking around in the condo. I knew that they could get up, they could go to the bathroom, they could go to bed safely, they could go get something out of the refrigerator, walk over to the microwave, warm it up. So those were strengths. And other strengths were, um, I did the cooking, so everything was prepared and ready for them to use. Um, <laughs> this is going to sound silly, but it really isn't. They both could relearn how to use the cable <laughs> and the TV. <laughs> and that's very important. That was very important. And they both could use a cell phone. So they could call me if they had to. Then I had to look at relationships. Who can help me? Well, the family that was the closest geographically, not so much. <laughs> when I needed to be gone um, and I was concerned, like, especially if I had to fly, I was always concerned if I had to fly somewhere because I knew I couldn't get back quickly. If I drove, I figured I could be home in three or four hours. <clears throat> Um, but when I had to fly, the family that was the closest that was like, oh, just ask us, oh, we're happy to help. Nah, nope, 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 nope. But the family that lived the furthest that had to fly in to help was the one who flew in to help from Atlanta to Cleveland. But I also asked friends, do you know anybody? And friends offered, oh, I can bring over dinner. I can do this. I can, um, do, does he need to go to an appointment? I can drive him to an appointment. 
But my point is, no one knew how they could help until I asked. And until I said, I need help. And they said, what help would you need? And I'd be like, oh, I just need somebody to come over and make sure they ate dinner <laughs> and do an eyes on check. <laughs> and they were like, we could do that. And my friend who said, your neighbor can do that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know her. <laughs> and I didn't, I did not know who she was. And uh, she has been a blessing. Technology, they both could use cell phones. They both could use the remotes. Oh, and please don't laugh, but I can't tell you how I had to reteach both of them how to use the remote for the TV. Um, they both could use the microwave. They both knew how to call. Neither one of them remembered how to use the, uh, a computer. Um, but my mother could play on the Kindle. She could play uh, solitaire and something else. And so it was like, yes, <laughs> that's good. She can do that, that's great. Um, and then community resources. I did not really look at community resources because they had their strokes two years before COVID. And I kind of had a rhythm and a routine and I didn't really need to look. And then once COVID hit, that, that was like, that wasn't gonna happen. So, um, and then eligibility specific supports. Um, they both are on, were on Medicare, Medicare, yeah. Um, and they're really, you know, we didn't need supports like government funding because they had a place to live, they had food. Um, so I really didn't look at eligibility specific. Their Medicare paid for their medical appointments, thank goodness, um, and their prescription, ah, I lied. They both had to go on a prescription that between the two of them cost $1,000 a month. And with insurance, with insurance. And so when one of the social workers asked me, do you need any help? And I said, yeah, how come this drug costs so much? And is there any way to get it cheaper? And she goes, there are programs, let me connect you. And it went from 900 and $30 a month to $60 a month for both of them. I know, I know. So I did, I did use eligibility specific supports. I forgot about that. Um, in charting the life course, you know, people need help thinking about possibilities. And people <laughs> are, you know, we've taught people to think about respite as a program. You can get so many hours of respite. Um, but think about who you know. This is a starter star, and it's just listing possibilities for people to think about. Um, you know, one, one um, uh, father that was on a call, um, I said, you know, think about when I started leaving, like to go to dinner with a, my friend, Christina, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't leave until they both ate dinner and they both were watching TV. So I didn't leave until their routine was pretty much done except going to bed. So I, you know, I said, think about when you can get away and it's not so intense to leave. Or do you know anybody that you can do like a timeshare? I'll, I'll watch your kid so you can go out and have a dinner or go Christmas shopping or whatever. And, uh, you know, you'll watch mine when I need to do something because other parents, you know, know some of what needs to be done and it may not be as shocking. Um, but as my partner needed more supports, I literally typed a schedule and the things that were important to him and think about it. He wanted his cereal in the same bowl, not the other bowls in the cabinet, but this one bowl. And that was important. Um, having, uh, what else was it? Oh, and I wrote all that out so that 
My angel who came in and gave me respite, it was on the counter in a plastic uh, sheet protector. And so she didn't have to remember, now what bowl am I supposed to give him the cereal in? And uh, you know, how much juice does he want? And <laughs> where's the dinner? How, how long do I microwave it for? It was all written down so that she could just go over to it and look at it. Barb, can I inter inter interrupt you for a second? Because sure. um, I know a few of these folks are connected with uh, community support in a uh, respite in a variety of ways. This form, um, you know, I want you guys to think about when a family signs up, you, you would look at maybe that child's name where it says respite support, and then you would go up there and ask the family, you know, what are his assets? What's he like? What, you know, that kind of thing. And then what the family support in. So this star um, that you see here will give a lot of answers. It'll show you actually where they might even be weak, which would be like relationships. Some families move away and they don't know anybody. And maybe the, the respite folks um, are the only ones that know them. So when you do it, do, use this kind of a form it's really easy to fill in and all the forms are free and they're fillable so you can type it in if your handwriting is like mine but this star um, can be used in multiple ways um, getting an eyeball uh, view of what's going on or a, a goal so I just wanted to mention that Barb thank you and if you are the providers of respite supports uh, in whatever setting you're providing this Da, 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 da. Come on, Barbara. Sorry. This form is also a way to start the conversation. So tell me what respite looks like. So you see what the stressors might be. So what would you do if you could have a short break? But because a lot of families, one mother told me um, that she finally got respite. And the way she got respite was she asked former teachers because they knew her son. And so it wasn't gonna be somebody who, you know, didn't know him or, okay, I wanna go back to where I was. <clears throat> and some, uh, anyway, so this mother asked former teachers and when she felt comfortable, um, when she said she finally felt comfortable that, you know, they would know how to work, support her son, blah, blah, blah. She said, I had no idea what to do. She said, because I hadn't thought to, well, geez, if someone else is here and I can leave, what would I do? And she very honestly said, I, I had no clue. <laughs> and so we may think, well, well, of course, of course, if we had respite, we would, you know, go to the grocery store or go take a walk or meet a friend for coffee or whatever. Uh, but she had done so caregiving for, I forget how old her son is, 17, and never had help, never. And so she said, I had no clue what to do. So again, in summary, uh, we want everyone to have a good life to be able to live, love, work, play, learn, and pursue their aspirations, whether they are the caregiver or the care recipient. Again, this can be used with all people across all ages, all abilities. We focus on the importance of supporting that family system so they can support the person they love. Um, and that it's important to have a trajectory what would it, what would good respite look like? What would I do if I had it? So I went over the vision tool, the respite portfolio, the starter star, just to give, that's just to give people ideas. Oh, technology. Oh, can they use a cell phone? Um, can they use a microwave? Do they, you know, my mother loved coffee. That was, and I don't know where I got that from, but I'm the same way. <laughs> so, you know, can she use the coffee maker? Um, and, and that was important. And can she watch TV? Can she turn on the remote? Um, 
And then I, we also gave you a link to the respite guide because it really goes through what to consider for each area of those forms. So I hope you see that a, a way that you can use these as your maybe, yeah, I can't even talk, bits and pieces. Um, I worked with a church in Cleveland when I was working for the county board and they did, uh, they had a special needs ministry. They had Sunday school and they provided respite Saturdays, I think quarterly. Um, and they had an application form and their application form looked worse than the application forms for county board services. And it was like, why are you asking all these questions? <laughs> why do you, what do you need all this information for? What you need to know is um, if the child is in Sunday school, what does the teacher need to know how to, you know, how to help him be successful and participate? Not when his last doctor's appointment was or what medications he's on. Because if anything happens, you're gonna call mom, dad, or 911. You're not gonna be giving them pills. So why are you asking questions that you're not gonna be using? But if you ask, tell me how to best support your loved one. Tell me what good respite looks like. Tell me how, what good interaction looks like. Tell me what they would wanna do. You know, what are their interests? These are some resources and everything as, um, as Deb said, all the resources that we, the handouts are all available on lifecoursetools.com. They are free, they are downloadable and they are fillable PDFs. But if you have any questions, um, Deb knows how to find me and my email is on the front, uh, the first slide, but please tell me, where I met you, because <laughs> give me some context if you email me. Um, so I, I would like to do a closing round and just ask you, what did you appreciate about the information today? And do you see how you might be able to use one of them? Oh, thank you for putting your camera on. Francis, can, you, can I ask you to share first? I'm sorry, I did not hear the question oh, or I just what? wanted, yeah, I'm sorry. I just wondered what you appreciated about the information or um, if you see something that you can use. Did I, did I share something with you that you're like, oh, I think that'll be helpful. Um, <coughs> right can now I, I'm dealing, I'm yeah. helping with an, an older fellow from our congregation who broke his leg a year ago and is living with his daughter, but I'm doing the respite so that she can continue. To, so I see him three times a week, three days a week actually, while she's working. Um, and it, it just, you know, the idea of making him realize that he's the one in control and I'm just doing whatever I can do to support him. Awesome. You know. Awesome. What a gift to his uh, sister. Sister? Is that what you said? His daughter. His daughter. It's oh, his okay. daughter. It's his daughter. What a gift right. to her. Awesome. Letting her right. also have her life, too. Thank you. Thank right. you so much. I didn't mean to put you on the spot asking you first. Caitlin or Wally? Well, that's anything? fine, but I, it breaks every once in a while you've been broken off and I've had to wait for it to come back. <laughs> and I think it's because the signal that I've had. Oh, so I'm sorry that was, that. It's okay. <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> you know, um, I think a big thing is... Um, through this respite series, we really want to help families think about what that respite can look like. And, you know, a lot of times there are people that we want to help, but we just don't know how. So by even offering time to maybe watch your children or be with them so they can get out and actually fill out 
the tool is you know what they need for rasp it and there's also there's also a form for a schedule so if a caregiver has a schedule and says can you come between 10 to 12 on thursday you know some people are very organized like that because that's their uh, survival uh, thing so the thing with these tools are uh, when you kind of play with them a little bit um, and actually, if you go on uh, YouTube, there's a ton of charting the life course uh, uh, videos um, to help with certain tools. And plus, Barb and I can help in any way uh, possible. But, you know, having been part of the disability community as long as I have, um, you know, honestly, I thought, oh, no, I have to learn another system. But that's not the case here because... Um, anyone can use these at any age with or without disability. It's just helping you think about your day and, and, and planning towards that good life. Um, I actually did, I'm just going to say this real quick. I actually did my uh, trajectory for my ambassador homework on um, decluttering my house. And so, you know, when you have the project trajectory, that's the good life and what I, what I don't want. Well, I didn't want my daughter to go like this when I die and I have all this clutter in the house that she has to get rid of. So, so my plan was I need to have a plan to get this stuff out of here. And so what are plans? Boxes, um, donation bo uh, boxes. So it's actually giving you time to think about things that would be otherwise overwhelming and and the thing that, um, and I'm just going to say this real quick, uh, there was an article in the paper um, that morning. I was doing my homework, of course, and, and I'm just looking up the quote because it's, it's amazing. Um, Clutter is essentially delayed decisions. <laughs> Agree? <laughs> so, anyway, I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Deb. So, Caitlin or Wally, anything that, you know, tonight that you're thinking, ah, that might help. I think I can use that or what you appreciated. Yeah, Barb, I'd be happy to share. Um, sorry, my internet's been terrible. I guess maybe everybody's tonight. Uh, I can, I've heard you the whole time, maybe not necessarily saw you, but um, I work for Johnny and Friends and- oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, Wally. You're so <laughs> Wally. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm going to turn my camera off just so that maybe the voice is better. Okay. Um, so, as I said... <laughs> oh, Wally, you're, you're out. Oh, that's so frustrating. Well, let's let's move to Christina, Caitlin. Um, yeah. So I've kind of done respite in a lot of different angles. Um, I mean, I work with Ashton Special Needs Ministry, so we provide respite nights twice a month. Um, nice. I've worked in group homes. I've I was a teacher, <laughs> so um, a lot of random things, but. Um, I do like the paint, like the sheets for the individuals to fill out. Um, there, I mean, there's what are they called? Independent service plans, which are pretty similar. Um, but I guess that would be a simpler way, I guess, to break it down. So I kind of like the idea of that in a respite setting. Awesome. If you use it, you have to share so we can learn from you. No, really, really, thank you. That's awesome. So you provide respite twice a month. Is it like an activity, uh, a respite so many hours or? I'm so, trying to explain the yeah. in Cleveland. Go ahead. Um, we, the location we use it is at two accessible churches. We go back and forth between the two. And it's the second and fourth Saturday nights of every month, except for November and December because of holidays. But um, so we have, well, our youngest is, I don't know, a few months old and our oldest is in her forties. Um, so pretty much anyone with a disability is welcome and their siblings are also welcome. Um, you guys were talking about like how sibling time is also, almost 
like taken sometimes. And I've seen that in our families. Like, um, for example, we had a trunk or treat the other night and uh, we knew that some of the siblings were not going to be able to, you know, make it through the trunks to do the treating. Um, so we had our, um, our Sunday school class open and had a few volunteers in there for the kids who couldn't make it through the um, outside event so that their siblings could still go with their parents. So oh, nice. we do include siblings as well, which is something that um, I feel like a lot of places don't really do. Um, but <laughs> yeah, we try to <laughs> help the whole family um so we usually have well right now like our last one we had 90 people there and we're completely volunteer based so um that includes volunteers and um people who came awesome. and then yeah and their parents just get a break so we had a family that came last year for the first time and they have twins that are 14 and their mom was like, this was the first time we've ever been able to go grocery shopping together, mm. like in the 14 years. And so, yep. um, yeah, all kinds of fun things. And it's definitely um, an exhausting three hours. <laughs> but um, when the parents come back and it's just visible how refreshed they've gotten and they're just the three hour break that we can provide for them and then the meal that we give their kids as well um they're mm -hmm. thankful for so well, it's, it's a time where they can feel like a, they know they're gonna have a break on such and such mm -hmm. date yep. yeah yeah and it's a, and it's and it's you're addressing the whole family which is so nice mm -hmm. and i want to read wally's note in chat i see the value of using this format for churches as they serve families living with disability, as well as for families conveying their needs to churches. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's awesome what Ashlyn Special Needs offers. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, the one church that I worked with in Cleveland um, also did something at uh, holiday time around Christmas, and it was to let the parents go Christmas shopping without the kids. So they did a, I don't know what they did. Was it a Saturday afternoon or something? And that way the, the parents could go Christmas, sh do their holiday shopping and have dinner. And they timed it so that they could, you know, go shop and then have dinner. dinner. Because how can you do that? I can't remember. Wally, one of the churches was um, Bay Presbyterian in Bay Village, Ohio, on the west side. Ah! <laughs> Caitlin invited us. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, uh, Bay Presbyterian Wally? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And I thought, what a cool thing to do. Um, I also have heard of some college uh, groups service groups offering respite in conjunction with like the Down Syndrome Association or an Autism Association as part of their service uh, work that they would have, you know, uh, like a, a respite fun afternoon, you know, and do face painting and have sports uh, games and all sorts of things going on. <clears throat> I have a question, Barb. Um, if you were going to use any of these forms, let's say you you have, you have a, a friend named Mary and she definitely needs respite and somehow you, you got time with her, um, which form do you think would be the best to start with? The, the person-centered uh, plan with respite, uh, the three-parter, or um, I'm just wondering if that was the best form. I think the first page to help her see that respite is a break. And if you had a break, what would you do? But also what would be good for your loved one? You know, is would they like to play video games? Would they want to go out and bike ride? You know, some of the therapeutic respite providers were like, you know, if the kid never gets to play basketball because whatever, then, and that's what would be good respite, 
let me, I'll go shoot hoops with them at the, you know, the park or the school. Um, so helping people see what they can, what respite could look like that would be pleasant and fun for the receiver, but also helping Mary think about what would you do if you had a break? Mm -hmm. And it yeah. might be lock myself in the room and read a book, I, you know, or it could be, uh, gee, I never thought of it. Okay, well, let's think about it. What would what would be good? What would you, what would give you? What would make you feel renewed? You know, um, whatever. Yeah. Well, I want to say that the next two sessions are on. Um, uh, the next one is on respite ideas that people have done. And so it's going to be kind of like our popcorn kind of thing where someone says, I did this, I did that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing those stories. And then the third one will be with um, Christina Tiemann and talking about the community respite that Caitlin's been talking about. So, um, you know, Barbara and I felt like this is a really important time to connect with the, those families because it's right before holiday. It's right before November, you know, thank Thanksgiving and Christmas and you know that's usually when people are in crisis yeah yeah well thank you all for joining and thank you for participating I, I appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we got a sneak peek that's for sure <laughs> I thank you all for joining us Barb thank you so much for taking the time um, it, it's an area that Barb and I had talked about a lot and we were just glad to have something to offer people in this uh, presentation. I appreciate your grace and mm -hmm. with technology and um, and Deb, before you leave, can you put the link for the feedback form in chat? Thank you. Our, thank you. Thank you. Thank is, you. Yeah, my work is grant funded. So if you would take a minute to answer, I think it's four questions, uh, but it's just a way, you know, to maintain our grant funding. <laughs> Trying to see where I where I push that. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Don't say uh oh. Okay, I won't. Mm. Oh, I wish we still had our um. Admin. <laughs> oh, admin. I'm gonna have to send it to you guys. Okay. Um, if if I can count on you guys filling that out, um, I'll send it to you tomorrow. All right. Any other questions or thoughts? Thanks you guys so much, Caitlin and Wally, uh, for hanging out with us, and we'll see you at the next, next respite event. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. All right, Deb. Good night, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It works. Hey, I know. It is what it is. Bye, Francis. See you. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you so much.